Um, thanks everyone for coming to, as I mentioned, my name is Andrew Smith from Campaign Against Arms Trade. I'm going to be talking a bit about my experiences with the national media. Um, it's in no way a defence of the national media. I agree with almost everything which just got said from the platform and by um, people in the floor as well. Um, I share almost all of the criticisms um, and definitely far from uncritical. But in the current climate also, we've all acknowledged national media does have a lot of power. And therefore, it, it, we do have to uh, work within it to do as best we can as well to try and get our messages out to the audience because we don't currently read the independent media, which we're hoping becomes more of the mainstream media in time. Um, I think actually the recent revelations about HSBC show just one example of what we probably already all knew, which is that all too often advertorial um, content and corporate interests are dictated as well. And this isn't just something which happens with national media, this happens even more so with the specialist media, um, where if you work for a representative company that advertises and then you're almost guaranteed good positive editorial. I know that because I've been in that position myself. Um, I should say before I joined campaigning in Stansford, I used to work for um, a fairly large uh, PR firm in London. So I kind of fell into when I was between jobs. Um, and it turned out I wasn't horrendous at it, so they kept me on. Um, but what was it? But it was definitely very different. I'm probably the only person who ever worked for both Campaign Against Arms Street and JP Morgan. Um, <laughs> what we did was very often financial sector stuff. Um, and although obviously the work environment is very different, it went from 150 people to nine, um, and went from the sort of crazy hectic seven day weeks to five. Um, I think actually some of the mechanics are the same. I think there are certain things which we uh, can do. And actually I think the measure of the importance of the national media is the huge amount of money which is spent on PR companies by various banks. It means we weren't even among the biggest, but we're getting multi-million pound retainers from banks who are very worried about their reputations and therefore would spend a lot of money on trying to influence the kind of journalists we were writing. One of the other differences with working for CAT is we no longer have a hospitality budget. It used to be the case that if we were taking a journalist out for lunch, you could spend about probably about £200 on that lunch. Whereas now if we go for coffee, the hope is that the journalist is paying for it. So that's one point to make. And another thing to say about national media is I think actually what we define as national media is changing as well. I think there are things like um, not just independent media, but also things like Al Jazeera or RT, which are far from flawless, um, but are, I think, actually picking up very large mainstream audiences and have a national reach as well. Similarly, there are online websites, things like Huffington Post um, and things like Open Democracy as well. But also in Scotland, there's been the National has launched recently, which is the kind of pro-independence daily. Um, and already, within its first three months, solidly sells more copies than both the Scotsman and the Herald, which have been around in Scotland for about um, got hundreds of years. Um, so I think actually the definitions we use are changing. I think one key point which was mentioned in the platform earlier was that even when people are consuming, getting news online, it tends to come from websites associated with newspapers. So the Mail Online gets its hundred million new readers every month, which shamefully I am one of them. Um, but also The Guardian is the fifth most read news site in the world, New York Times is up there as well, and these are already obviously large print things. So actually this is a point to mention about um, online. Um, much of what I'm going to say can also be applied to the local media. Um, I think there's points to make about local media separately, which is that local media has been suffering death by a thousand cuts, and there's a lot of papers now working with very skeletal staff and owned by, very, by large publishing companies, so you usually find a person who writes for one paper writes for probably every other newspaper in the borough or every other newspaper in the county or whatever as well. Um, and actually I think, but actually one interesting thing about local media is all polling and things usually finds that there's a lot more trust in it. It sells less papers obviously, but people actually still view it as having credibility and being something which um, kind of speaks within the community as well. Um, so I think there's a definitely an uh, importance to that as well. Obviously, there's a ma there, I'm a massive fan of blogs, and I think actually things like blogs can have a massive effect. We saw that in Scotland over the end, and where it felt Caledonian rooms over Scotland became uh, really pretty instrumental in the whole pro-independence campaign. Although actually the wider news agenda and broadcast news and things is still being set by the old guard of the kind of Scotsman and your Herald and things like that. Um, I kind of want to uh, give a, I kind of want to now talk a little bit about how 
to work with national media. And um, obviously, the way you approach different papers and different journalists is going to be fundamentally different. We've done uh, work at CAT with even the Tory Graph and the um, Daily Mail papers like that. And obviously, if we're trying to work with them, we do it on a very different basis from how you would regard an independent. I'm more than that, going to kind of details about that in the discussion. But fundamentally, a large part of it is, as cliche as it sounds, is about building relationships. It's about getting to know the individuals who are writing about it. And if they trust you, then they become far more likely to use your stories or to use you as a talking head. And that's not so much even about them necessarily agreeing with you. It's more about um, if they know that they'll get something which is approaching a quotable, which is an quotable opinion, and they can get it very quickly, or they know that, you're, that you've got resources and can get the information then it makes them far more likely to, um, to get in contact. Now, whenever we, we can come up with a story, rather than send it out blanket, we would normally pitch it as an exclusive to um, certain journalists. Now, the best way to do that would be sometimes identify where you want it to go first, or alternatively, look into who's been writing about this particular issue and approach them first and work out the journalist before the publication. Um, and then it, that can easily be find out if we've got a story on, say, arms to Saudi Arabia, we'll look at who's been interested in Saudi Arabia in the past. So ideally you want the journalist to buy into the story. Um, at this stage, always phone them, never email, because the average journalist for a national paper will get about 700, 800 emails every single day. Um, and we'll probably delete huge, huge quantities of them without even looking at it. Um, so look who has sympathy on your issue, or look who's covered it, look who's remotely interested in it. And then decide who you're approaching. One specific journalist I want to mention is um, Cale Milne at The Independent, who I think is an absolutely outstanding journalist. He's very good. Um, we worked with Cale on a story, which hopefully some of you read about last summer, with um, the story about UK arms sales to Israel. Um, this was just as the embargo of Gaza was happening. Um, we worked with Cale on the story. Um, we got in touch because I noticed he'd written some uh, fairly sympathetic stories to us in the past about the arms trade. So we got in touch, we discussed, this is the data we have on Israel, this is on the arms to Israel. These are the companies that are implicated. He then took it to um, his editor or whatever, who was actually very interesting. We ended up getting a front page story from it, which for an organization of our size of our budget was probably about a first. Um, and what came from that was not just the original story, because actually when you get big news and it ends up becoming bigger news elsewhere, because other people then pick it up as well. So I ended up in press association and so on and so forth. Um, but what came from working with Kale on that, um, he was grateful obviously because we approached him in the first instance and uh, we worked on the story together with him. And I have to say he didn't at any point try to influence any of our kind of messaging and actually I think everything he published from us in terms of our quotes and our data which was used was, I would say, completely accurate. Um, and he's also someone who's not afraid to do digging, so he approached all the arms companies for comment and things like that, and most of them they ended up implicating themselves further, which is quite nice for us. But as I say, it kind of led to more good coverage as a result, because it meant that it got picked up elsewhere, and then by, that happened Friday, by the time we went into work on Monday, it had been all over um, some BBC and The Guardian and things like that as well. Um, and it did have an impact in terms of um, the fact in terms of the fact that I think that helped make the whole issue of UK arms and UK complicity in what's happening in Gaza into more of a mainstream story which is being picked up in other places as well. Um, so I thought that was certainly one thing to come from that, but the relationship with Kale stayed very well actually. We had two further front page stories with him as well in the last six months. Uh, one which was all follow up on arms to Gaza, specifically in the three months leading up to the compartment. And um, also, we had one on an arms dealer's dinner which happened in the Tower of London as well. Um, so it's always worth trying to get to know journalists as well as you can. And I expect that this next part's much easier when you're in London because all the media is based in London. But if you can also try and get someone face to face as well, so that they hopefully then think that you're a relatively nice person or they're vaguely interested in you as well, then it, as I say, it does mean that you start getting inquiries and they come to you a bit as much as you would to them. Um, and a few kind of do's and don'ts so for any kind of campaigning. These are all my opinions, so I totally respect for you. Other people might disagree, that's absolutely fine. I would say keep the press releases very short, specifically in terms of the quotes, because I've seen we do, we help out with um, other kind of anti-militarism groups 
um, who are doing kind of local press work. And the amount of kind of quotes I've seen which are about four paragraphs long. And you know fine well that the story is only going to be four paragraphs long. So try and make sure your quote is as sound bitey as it can be while actually having the weight of the point behind it. But it's preferably very short as well. Because journalists will usually read the first the headline the first paragraph and then probably not much further if it's too weighty and so on. Um, as I say, um, appreciate the deadlines of journalists. For example, if it's a weekly paper, whether that's a regional weekly or whether that's something like The Observer, make sure you're not phoning them on Friday, make sure instead you do it on Monday or Tuesday when we're starting to put the uh, plans together for next week's paper. Similarly, on that point, if you're calling news desks in the daily paper, always do it before 10 o'clock, because that's roughly when most newspapers will have their kind of con editorial conference meetings and things like that. So it's always best to get in as early as possible. You also tend to get people while they're feeling a bit more polite and affable at that point as well. Um, obviously know the publication uh, which you're talking to, when you're talking to particularly local media, um, if you, for example, we're doing a story with them, I'll go quickly for Essex at the moment, um, but Essex is obviously a very, very large area. And of course, North Essex and South Essex is totally different to the press as well. So make sure that you're talking to a light press, but that you're also talking to the right person. Um, if there isn't someone on the website who's written about your issue beforehand, then try and talk to someone on the news team or ask who the best person to speak to would be. So you're not talking to the sports correspondent about arms sales in the Middle East or something. Um, always actually have a story as well. Now this is much easier when um, I was at the um, agency because we had a huge budget for doing research. And actually the point which you made earlier is completely true. The amount of stuff in the press which is just regurgitated press releases is quite remarkable. Um, but we could always conduct those silly surveys that drop the hat which find that people prefer X to Y or whatever. Um, I'm going to give you a good example of a story which um, I came up with actually, which I'm quite ashamed of in some ways. Because um, it's a really, 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 really awful news story. Um, but it did result in me getting promoted at work, and this is actually kind of taking me on to my next point. This was back in, must have been 2011, when Prince William and Kate Middleton got married. There was long before there was any kind of, uh, before Prince George was conceived or anything like this. But there was all the speculation in the papers about um, when they would have a royal baby. Um, so in this instance, we came up with it. The client we were talking to was a history, was a history related website who wanted to have more media, more national media coverage. So we came up with a story which was based on predicting the date of birth of the royal baby. Um, so it was based on a really silly scientific mathematical formula, which is very in depth, which involves me going through Wikipedia, looking at previous royal marriages, the gap between the first royal, between the royal marriage and the first royal baby, and calculating the average number of dates. Um, and then we got a story out of this, and it went pretty far. It ended up in Vogue magazine, we got the to as a team of scientists. Um, <laughs> ended up in like the Daily Mail and Metro and things like that. But the point of it being the one, the one thing which I think is actually relatively good about that story was it didn't cost us a single penny to put together. Um, it was completely free for us from that perspective. And we can, I kind of have to apply that same sort of logic, albeit nowhere near that level of rigorous journalism, to um, my current job with CAT, because we don't churn out lots and lots of research all the time. We have a, a research coordinator who's incredibly overworked, but we don't have sort of lots of money to send off to consultancy to find things out for us. So instead, what we'll tend to do is think about what's in the news or what we're expecting is going to come up in the news, focus as much as we can on a couple of days on that, call up a journalist who's vaguely interested and say, just so you know, we find these new stats in Saudi Arabia or whatever. Um, and we can do that relatively efficiently because new arms sales uh, happen all the time. But the main point is that if Saudi Arabia is not in the news agenda, we have to try and get it in there. Um, and that's the point where I say always make sure you actually have a story. Um, so make sure your press lists are up to date as well, um, which I appreciate can be particularly difficult because things like media databases cost a lot of money, we don't use one any longer. Um, in my current job, uh, it means having to troll around the internet every now and again to find out who the new people are. Um, try and meet them if possible, which I appreciate is much easier. Um, in London as well. I mean, the point I'm kind of getting at here is that media is not so much about what's in the public interest as much as it is a projection of what 
really affects public is interesting. Um, all told through its own kind of regurgitation. On that point, I kind of think you have to assume that the journalist you're talking to, you have to assume knows probably less about the subject than you do if it's a campaign you're involved in. In which case, keep it as simple as humanly possible as to the point as humanly possible, and again, assume absolutely no prior knowledge whatsoever. Um, before I conclude, another point would be to be reactive as well as proactive. It very often happens that something which isn't news one day becomes news the next day. Saudi Arabia is a good example of this because we saw King Abdullah um, died last month. Then suddenly, um, people who the day before wouldn't have been interested in the fact that Britain sells three point has sold £3.8 billion pounds worth of arms to the Saudis under this government alone. And um, people who weren't, weren't previously interested in that suddenly became a little bit more interested in that. So we had to be reactive and make sure we got our comment out as soon as possible. Which is much harder to do, because at that point I was on a train going up to Edinburgh for a wedding. Um, but then kind of typing it away and using the terrible Wi-Fi on the East Coast. Um, but the main point about it is that when, even when some big story breaks, journalists are also, so in some cases, just looking to get a quote from anyone, or anyone who might have any level of knowledge about it whatsoever. There are obviously filters and editorial, I'll have to talk about that more in discussion, um, but we found that people who wouldn't previously have listened to us um, beforehand suddenly listen to us more if we get a quote out within the first 45 minutes or so of something breaking. Um, in terms of conclusions, before we can talk about it a bit more, um, obviously mainstream media has many, many faults. And I, I know that there are questions about the term mainstream media. I don't actually have a massive reservation about using the term because unfortunately we have to accept where we are at the moment, which is that this media does have a lot of reach. As long as the sun sells a million copies a day and influences all of the entire broadcast media, then unfortunately it is mainstream whether we like that or not. I don't think anyone in this room does. The other thing aspect is it has not, just, not only does it have reach, but it doesn't actually have an element of credibility. While journalists aren't trusted, I think people, there is still the issue of people going to, straight on to the established newspapers' websites, which shows that they are trusted to a point. They're trusted to the point that people who aren't necessarily reading the independent media do still see them as being the established places to get the news from. Um, but also, what, I, what we find with Pat is that when we do get a story and say the independent or the Garden of the Mirror or something like that. It does have um, an influence in terms of the coverage appears and there might be a fallout from it and so on. But inevitably we also see that we that when we get a story published somewhere we get more followers straight away on social media, more donations come in, more hits go onto our website, the more we get, the more stories we get out of the more people come to us for stories. Um, and I think that's one of the kind of interesting as the important aspects of it. Obviously bringing down the global arms trade is a marathon and not a sprint. But in our case, we need to try and use every, every tool we have at our disposal and try to reach out to as many people as possible. And that's kind of why we do use the local and national media a lot. Um, in terms of discussion, I'm interested in your kind of experiences of it. Your thoughts, I'm happy to go into kind of views on the media. I don't massively disagree with anything that was said earlier, but I think that the whole issue is interesting. I do think media is changing a lot, and we're also seeing the rise of free papers and things. And actually, the media is genuinely in crisis. I mean, bear in mind that every single newspaper in the country is, almost every newspaper in the country, actually, there's one or two exceptions, is losing not just money, but print readers at the moment. The only newspaper, not two newspapers in the country, aren't losing print readers that I'm aware of, which are the Sunday Herald, which has become a lot more popular since the support of Scottish independence. But, um, also, the Times. And the only reason the Times isn't reading, losing print readers is because it's only national, which has a paywall on its website. So I think there is a definite crisis within media, and um, within the kind of billionaire-owned media as well. And um, I think that does that does pose an opportunity for us as well. Um, but yeah, I wanted to give some thoughts into bit news as well. So, any thoughts or questions that you like? Or any experiences of with any of your big like own campaign groups which have worked with you and how you find that? I was wondering how the use of comments on online representations of print media is affecting the way they view themselves and because so often, like even if you read the Daily Mail or something mm -hmm. online and the comments are just half the time they tell you a lot more truth than the story did. But do we have any idea of how the media's 
coping with that. And quite often the story will have open for comments and other times it doesn't. And how do they judge that? And, and you know, I just wondered how, what impact that was. I mean, I personally, when I get worried about comments and all the things being shared is that I do think one of the big shortfalls of online media is that when I go online to a news site, and most people do, you don't browse the newspaper, so to speak, and see what's in it. You only go straight to the part you're already interested in. Um, and unfortunately, newspapers now know exactly which articles are the most popular, which at the moment is speculation about the colour of the dress, um, which for what it's worth, I thought was orange and white. But that might be a kind of something different. But um, yeah, the problem I have with it, in a sense, is now that people know exactly what the most popular articles are, I think that's influenced the way which the media has been reported. I think comments probably do influence it to a level as well. Having said that, I think there's always a danger of looking down at the comments, because while they can be interesting and sometimes, um, I think, can include very interesting links and things as well, I know that any comment piece I've written for a relatively large publication, as soon as you see the comments, it's, well, there's, I think there's a lot of people, and particularly we find this when we were doing articles about um, Israel over the summer, there's an or I think it feels sometimes like there's an organised kind of attack yeah. on the comment spread. And it's just, Don't you think that looks so obvious now? It does, it, it as, does. As we get more savvy to it. The saddest part, I think, is on the Daily Mail comments. You can see people upvote comments, so you can see what the most popular ones are, and they're usually ones that border on fascism. <laughs> deeply concerning. Um, but yeah, I think that actually that's how like comments do influence. The other thing I should say which influences, I was talking to um, one of the military correspondents at a national paper, we were talking about paywalls, and I asked him if he thought his paper was going to go down the paywall route. He said, no, we're not going to be charging for access, instead we're going to sell everyone's, all our readers' data. And the point of it being that, of course, they want to get as many hits as possible, and so this is where clickbait things come into play. This is where you kind of see the sort of people who are sometimes reading because of the comments, but also, um, the, the also be aware that your data is probably being sold somewhere, because that paper won't be the only one which is doing it. Um, any other kind of thoughts? Okay, we've got go on. Um, I'm Mary Crompton, I, I live in Chaunton and I decided to stand for election as a local councillor in, in that. Uh, but as an independent because well, I don't want to attach myself to any parties. Mm. And I'm wondering how best, as an independent, to get, get myself known in the local press and, and get my message out there. Yeah, I can give you some advice. I, can, I actually ran for local council in the elections last May, um, albeit for the Labour Party, which I'm not sure is necessarily you would agree with. Um, but um, 41 votes off me, but not better. Um, <laughs> we lost the council by one as well. Anyway, um, that's my point. The point was in terms of the kind of local issues and things we did with that. Um, as I say, local press loves local stories. So in a sense, I think it, you're pushing out an open door. And as I say, one of the kind of one of the side effects of local press shedding lots and lots of stuff is that they're probably more, in a sense, reliant on press releases and people doing cold calls in the story, which is unfortunate but true. Um, and actually, if you're running for uh, local council, I think identify whatever, if there's something closing in your area or something big like that, <coughs> find a, kind of go up with a couple of people in bands looking one or angry, depending on which you're best at. Um, and things like that, I think, can actually pick up some very easy free coverage as well. But um, I think also, what I notice in our local papers is that it's the same people who write letters to them every single week. Um, and any time I've written a letter, it's broadly speaking, usually got published, just isn't assigned my great letter writing ability, it's a sign that they weren't getting that many letters, I think. Um, and actually, I think that's probably not, that's probably not a bad idea as well, kind of really hitting up the letters pages. Um, when we do kind of local stories with um, regional press for kind of local cat groups or other kind of local anti-militarism groups and things like that, we would tend to initially put out a story which is usually just their sort of generic -y sort of thing about local people outraged by arms companies on doorsteps, sort of thing, which you can use once in every region and no one notices in a sense. Um, but they're quite good because actually in most cases lots of people don't know when there's arms companies on their doorstep as well. Um, we're looking at one as I say for South Essex and one which has four including one which armed Israel on its doorstep which no one really would necessarily know about in the area. Um, but kind of the point being made is that actually we're surprised by to what extent 
regional papers have, and I think this is actually due to, due to real problems in regional papers and real staffing issues in particular, but I'm always surprised to what extent they actually regurgitate our press releases. And I'm actually very happy that they do, because they get some good anti-militarism lines in there. Um, and, but I, us I usually find that you're pushing it a bit of an open door. I would say also with local, try and get to know the politics journalist, whoever writes about local politics in your area, give them a call, let them know you're standing for council. They'll appreciate getting a call from you directly rather than <coughs> anonymous press officer for Labour Tory candidate, and then ask them if you want to go for a coffee or whatever, and then I kind of also build it from there. That would be a sign, and good luck in the contest as well. Okay. When's the election? Is it put May, yeah. Oh, is it in the general election? Yes, I know. Oh, excellent. Well, best of luck. Thank you. <laughs> um, I suppose the journalist needs all going up, and he is really not care much what's written in the town about what they really are worried about what's written in the town 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 about what's written yeah I would actually completely agree with that I would say where we do get concerned is we did a story um, earlier this month there was an arms dealers dinner in Park Lane in uh, the Hilton Hotel, which had over 40 MPs at it. We were all being, having their um, £250 dinners paid for by arms companies, including in several of the Shadow Defence Secretary. And you're kind of thinking, isn't there a fairly obvious conflict of someone who will be awarding arms company contracts, taking money from an arms company who are buying this dinner and things like that? But anyway, to kind of point out, and we released the list of MPs, and we've got some fairly obnoxious phone calls from the offices of MPs who were not best pleased about it. Um, a couple which by the way came very late in the night and I think were slightly tired and emotional at the time. Um, <laughs> not naming names. But I think actually the point about the local press is completely right. I think this is the sort of thing where if we've got uh, if we're trying to influence a particular local MP, and a really good example of this is Vince Cable. Um, Vince Cable used to be actually very good on the arms trade. He used to keep saying he needs to be brought under control and it was too much corruption and things like that. He's now the uh, minister for the department that awards um, our licenses for arms sales. So he's now actually in charge of selling arms and under his watch lots of sales have gone up. However, what we have done worked quite well with the Richmond Press on is um, we've had a number of stories which we've worked on with activists in Richmond which has specifically targeted Vince Cable. And he really hasn't liked that because he's had kind of his office picketed and things like this from anti-arms trade campaigners doing the parental thing of holding his own words against him. Um, and I think actually these sorts of things, I think MPs really worry about that, especially when there's an election coming up. And one thing which was interesting about the story we did on the um, arms dealers dinner was while the national um, press on it had been quite good and was giving kind of broad brush strokes on the whole thing, um, they mainly highlighted Jeremy Vine from the BBC was speaking at it and that Vince Cable was talking at it. But it rolled out into the, into the regional coverage as well, because we sent to the papers for the MPs who were there. And there were some really, really vicious articles, and I was really happy about that. Um, and you'd have MPs falling over themselves to explain that actually it's a large employer who actually aren't located in our constituency, but we might one day want and things like this, and trying to give excuses for taking a free dinner from companies that profit from selling weapons to despotic regimes. But the point was that it resulted in a lot of coverage we didn't want, only three months out from the election. And we saw MPs trying to distance themselves, trying to contextualise what they had done, this, that, and the other, uh, in a way that they were put under a local scrutiny, they weren't put under national. Because the uh, uh, downside incentive naming 40 MPs is you're not going to see 40 paragraphs, one explaining each MP. But we did find in the print uh, stuff regionally there was a lot of fallout. They all carried our quotes without any sense or anything whatsoever as well. And uh, it was a good way of putting those MPs in the spots to completely, and especially if you're in a marginal seat and there's an MP who you don't like, or an MP who um, is particularly offensive to a campaign group you're involved in, then certainly target them. And especially because this will be the kind of only period, probably in the next five year cycle, where local media is actually probably investing in politics reporting. Um, and I think that you could be pushing it open door again. Like, and this is probably something you should take on if there is specific scandals about the MP for the Chelmsford. Uh, for children, I don't know who the MP for that is, but if there's a specific issue with them, then this is probably your best chance to really get some dirt on them. Like, <laughs> 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 no, 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 I don't really want to 
the, the MP we've got is, is a lovely bloke, but it's quite big, isn't it? Um, so, so, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's why I thought local councillor would rather than, than go for an MP, because I think he's actually quite a good guy, and I don't really want to be... Maybe I'm too nice, you know, I don't, I don't want to ditch it on any kind of but, so. I don't know, there's a kind of aspect on the license point, the one point I kind of make is that <coughs> I think while there is most definitely there are huge editorial problems and ownership problems with um, the national and regional press in our country, I wouldn't view it in an almost kind of, I, there is an element of, I, I, the word conspiracy is so loaded, but there's an almost kind of conspiratorial part at the top of the tree, I think. But actually, your average journalist at a publication, I've usually found to be, actually very nice um, and usually I think there's an unconscious kind of there's an unconscious kind of bias I think the further down you get in terms of reporters and so on and it's not necessarily that they've got an editor telling them this will be the line on every single issue ever because bear in mind that Rupert Murdoch Bally is incredibly powerful and obviously dictates some element of what happens in the sun he probably doesn't read it every day. he certainly doesn't read every story before it goes into publication that sort of thing but I think there's kind of an ingrained bias um, but I think, uh, for example, I went for coffee recently with one of the um, military writers of the Daily Mail. And actually we found that while we were having coffee, we were, she was very nice, we actually agreed on that a lot. And strangely enough, we've actually had some good positive coverage within the Daily Mail. Um, and that's been because we've taken it from a very different angle. If we're approaching the Daily Mail, we focus entirely on the hypocrisy of something. And entirely on... Um, isn't it ridiculous that a country as great as Britain is doing this and selling weapons to all these despots? And that actually goes down quite well sometimes. If you're doing it in the sort of approaching the Guardian of Independent, you take it from a slightly different angle. Um, but again, you're reaching a different audience. Um, but I, yeah, as I say, when, I, when meeting journalists from papers that I don't like, and I don't hate the papers at all, I've always found that the journalists are actually usually quite nice people who've got into journalism for the right reason, which is to try and do higher to a point. Um, but then working for incredibly powerful people to do so. Um, so I think there's an issue in there as well. Uh, yeah. With regard to um, what the media is allowed to do regarding campaigns, I'm running as well, but I'm running in the general election against George Osborne and Tatton. Best of luck. Great of luck. No, you know, it's, I've been wanting to engage with this guy for so long, and, and we've been addressing him on the anti fracking for three and a half years now. Then that opportunity came up, there was no way I was going to miss it because it's a platform. Would you, would, it depends on your aim. I'm not aiming to win, I'm aiming to. Not my bad attitude, you would. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> but I don't know. It's, it's, it's just surprising emails of the people saying that, you know, we may look conservative, but it's only because there was never anybody else. You know, and that, that deep down there could be quite a decent green thread there. But I, I don't really, I've, I've actually just got to, and I'm hoping you might shortcut this for me. Research what's permissible when you're running as a candidate. Um, after you reach that, like March 30th, where we go into a period called Purdue. That's the short campaign. At the yeah, and, and so having, I'm new to politics, and, and I have upcoming interviews, and I'm never quite sure what, what is it I'm, that they have to do. What does the press have to do with regard to showing no bias and, and showing I think, drinks? as far as I'm aware, and my experience would be very different because I was, at that point when I was running, it was for one of the main political parties, so we had kind of got filtered through an organiser a bit. Um, my understanding of it is that that's suddenly where they have to show impartiality, which involves giving different, giving similar levels of space to certain parties and things like that. So it never seems to affect the big two. But um, does that apply then to? Is that only with the media that we, we're commonly used to have? I can't remember how Donald Trump described it, but the the media that's you know the, the mainstream essentially, or, or but like with independent media. I mean, when you look at things like say the, you know Kaiser report. Mm. Artist tax people like that who do stuff which I conceive of as media, but it is, does that count? I mean, how do they count what is media? I'm really not sure. Um, I think with locally, with local media, I'm certainly I haven't. I think that there's pressure on journalists um, from local media, especially if there's a little effort for local MP who's putting pressure on them. I get feeling that happens, but I'm not sure what the legislation. Is. But my, I would tend to think that, for example, if you're standing against George Osborne, a good thing to do would probably be to have a visual stunt where you get within a close circumference of him and then you'll get lots of media attention for, I don't know, handcuffing yourself to him or something. <laughs> He's never um, he doesn't actually have anything to do. And those sorts of things could work. Yeah. I'm not sure about the actual legislation, but as I say, it might be well worth you contacting specifically your local paper's political desk. And asking what their policy is. 
and then ask him to fancy a coffee and then find out okay. as much as you can. Yeah, uh, just that um, I'm from Impress, which is the independent press regulator. So um, we might be able to help in terms Fantastic. of the regulation. Fantastic, thank you. Process, so. Our leader has lifted everyone yeah. from <laughs> yes. the Yeah, particularly with, with what counts as media. That's the hardest part, you know, in in sure, what, what is media. Well, in short, there's no regulation, really, that is effective in, in terms of political impartiality. It, 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 Newspapers have to be accurate, but they, they don't necessarily have to be partial to the regulations that they're signed up to at the moment. You mean broadcasters? Well, broadcasters do, but they're under separate regulations for newspapers. So local newspapers, as long as it's not radio, TV, it, the, the, the written word is under different regulations and they don't have to be impartial. What about the independent stations on YouTube and stuff? What does that count? I think that's on YouTube. I don't know if YouTube's off, but it's definitely not under the regulation of the press. Yeah, make as much noise against Osborne as you can. I think everyone in this room will have I want to believe that as activists, though, we can seize the use of our independent press during that period of Perla when the others are perhaps as quick and nimble to getting onto the idea that there is an independent press that's talking to vast numbers of people, that maybe that's our route to talk to people, particularly people who are going to be on the same way, you know. I wouldn't entirely rule out also things like, um, say, Huffington Post is a good example because it has a really large circulation. And it's relatively easy to write for them so far as um, anything I've written for them. They've, they've, only ever sent, they've only ever refused one thing I wrote for them, which, albeit, was probably a sensible move, being as the headline was Roman Polanski, the thinking man's Gary Glitter. Um, <laughs> and they refused that piece. Um, which I can understand. In terms of arms trade stuff, they've never refused anything. They've never they've called occasionally to double check a fact or something, um, but I've never noticed any significant editing or anything like that. And I think actually that's one example of a actually very mainstream thing. And actually, what's very very good at is also if you have a blog which you're sharing, then they'll tend to share it as well, which gets out to a readership who wouldn't necessarily read it if it was on Red Pepper, for example. Which isn't in any way to criticise Red Pepper. I think it's fantastic. This is a very different readership from Huffington Post. Um, and I think there's a few different sites like that, which are, um, especially internet only sites, I've always found tend to be really looking for comments. Things like even International Business Times and so on have uh, run place pieces which we've kind of approached them for and said we can have it with you in two hours. And they're like, fantastic. Um, and actually, I think with web only stuff, that's quite an effective point. Because bear in mind, no one's really been able to monetize the internet yet. The websites bring in some money for advertising, but at this point, almost nowhere near enough to actually fund what they're doing. So we need as much content as they can, and we want to, to be honest, get as much content as they can for free. Um, and I'd also suggest with websites like, say, the New Statesman has a different kind of online setup to what it does as a magazine as well. And I think the Staggers of the New Statesman is a very good kind of blog which gets updated every couple of hours. And if you can try and get something on there, which, is, which we've had before, and it's not been particularly difficult, we've done a bit back and forth, but nothing significant. Um, I think that's a really good site to be trying to get used to get your message through as well. And any other kind of questions or comments? I think we're probably we've got five minutes left, so if anyone knows any good jokes in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, hopefully, yeah. Um, I've, I've recently started at New Internationalist, oh, so we are an alternative. Yeah. I love it. Me too, I'm so, so, so excited. I would be. <laughs> Um, so it's yeah, independent, yeah. alternative, media cooperative, mm. um, and I've, I've kind of picked up that we've been really struggling to get any coverage because we're a media organisation, so trying to get your articles then reaching, you know, main, mainstream media hitting out. They don't like covering other media, and um, we. I just wonder if you have any tips or advice. Well, first thing I think, actually, in a sense, the media loves talking about the media, and so far as when something happens at a mainstream papers, the other papers all jump on it, and I, I think there's a difference between how they would necessarily cover Fallout at the uh, Times or something from what we would with New International. So I don't think, I think there is an issue where with journalists are far more interested in the inner workings of the media than the people who aren't journalists. In terms of New International, I know New International does a lot of things um, out with its written stuff as well. And actually, I think a really good example is New Statesman, which has, actually, which has had a lot of uh, really kind of big story interviews and kind of guest editorial things and things like that over the last couple of years. And in those cases, we've always got really widespread coverage 
for it before it goes to print. Now, I'm not expecting necessarily Russell Brand will edit the next New Internationals, but when he did edit the uh, New Statesman the, the week he did it, it ended up on sort of news night night before and all over BBC News and things like that. So I'm unfortunately mm -hmm. guest columnists make sure that their column, if it's something interesting, gets kind of sent to someone. Uh, uh, preferably if they say something outrageous, and when you call the Guardian or whatever and say, you wouldn't believe what in a certain name has just said. That's one of the kind of different things uh, which can be done. But I think certainly it was Before it gets public. Was certain, yeah, yeah. Um, certainly I don't think there's any easy answer on that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, think, I hope that, it, that you do, because I'm a big fan of New Internationals, so I think it's excellent. And I've actually just renewed my subscription this Yay! morning. Anyone who wants to renew, just yeah. sit down with the first <laughs> <laughs> I think you did guest editorials. Guest we editors. do, we, we do have guest editors. Yeah. Um, or a whole issue. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. On hold issues. Yeah. 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 But um, yeah, we do have guest editors. For us, they're quite well known. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Often, but not maybe. But then again, your activist community has been growing so much, I'd say, mm. in the last few years, that perhaps as your readership would grow anyway, just naturally by the fact that we're more like we are now. You know? I think actually one thing I totally sing New Internationals praises on is that when we've done kind of guest blogs to New Internationals, we did one a few days ago actually, um, on <coughs> the why there should be a move from sort of arms company jobs yeah. into green energy. Um, but we usually find with New Internationals that. Um, it's good that if we get a piece in there, we we'll promote the hell out of it on social media. And we know find our new internationals promotes as well, so it ends up being beneficial to both sides. Mm -hmm. And so far as we get new people finding out about us, new internationals get new readers who are already sympathetic to at least one thing which has been in it, and therefore more likely to read on as well. And um, Sasha, that's another thing entirely to group. So certainly, say I think there's a. I don't in any way want to diminish any kind of independent publications off your sort of red pepper, open democracy, new internationals type things in any way, shape or form. I think they're all absolutely excellent. Um, and, it, but I've, and I think actually I would thoroughly recommend everyone does try to do some kind of writing for your, for your campaigns or your groups for those. And I think they're absolutely very good for the title, they get a lot of shares, it's good for you because seeing something in writing from you gives it, it kind of gives more credibility to an organisation to say we had this published in here because it's a third party endorsement. And actually on that point, this is kind of final point on why actually the national media where we can work with journalists and they report us all the better because um, it's you singing your own praises is always fine, brilliant, you can make an argument better than anyone else, but if someone else is making it for you and quoting you approvingly, then unfortunately that's what carries a lot of weight with a lot of readers. Um, but yeah, hopefully in this conversation we've kind of covered a lot of uh, hopefully useful ground for people. Um, as I say, in no way is this meant to be a defense, as any of this been a defense of the kind of national media um, or its ownership or its editorial lines or pretty much anything about it. But I do think that there are still opportunities in there and that lots of people read it. So as long as that is the case, unfortunately we have to take it. Um, thanks everyone who, for coming on, thanks all for your thoughts.